So I am really, really excited to be uh, joined by a fellow leadership consultant, leadership coach, executive coach. And uh, I first reached out to our guest, uh, Jen Lofgren, via LinkedIn because I saw a lot of her content was was really bang on and it hit on a lot of things that I personally feel strongly about when it comes to leadership and, and leadership development. I'm really, really excited. And Jen, I guess instead of me going on and on and on about your credentials, um, you know, what could the the viewers and the listeners, what do they need to know about you, Jen? Well, maybe I'll start with you know what I do today and then how I ended up doing what I'm doing today. And my role today is I'm the founder of Insido Executive and Leadership Development. And I'm a master certified coach and I've been coaching leaders across North America for more than a decade. And in our firm, we work with leaders, executives, and leadership teams, and we help leaders figure out what's truly important so they can become more strategic and personally fulfilled to do their highest and best work. And we work with leaders from you know, a wide range of industries all over North America, and I've been blessed to work with leaders that have been through our major economic downturns since uh, starting the business in 2009 and starting the business in a downturn, seeing the decimation uh, that happened to many of our clients' businesses in the 2015 downturn, uh, supported some organizations that were impacted by the uh, floods that happened in Alberta in 2015, and then supporting clients through the, uh, the current crisis that we're experiencing. And where it started is, uh, I had a first career in information technology. And I was in network architecture for more than a decade. And I was faced with moving into a uh, more senior leadership role and looking at the next step of my career. And I kept putting it off and kept putting it off. And I got curious of what that's about. And I started thinking about what I wanted in my career and why I was one foot out when it came to moving into more senior leadership roles. and. I realized I wasn't passionate about the core of what I was doing, which was the technology. And I was looking at the leaders that I reported to, and I didn't want to be like any of them because they were really great, nice people. And they were all pulling out their hair and they would yell at me and they would yell at my team and they were just stress baskets. And I thought, wow, I don't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought about what I wanted to do. And I started looking at, all of the things that I really enjoyed in my role. And as I said, none of it was the core of what I did. I just happened to be gifted and good at the abstract thinking required for that kind of technology. I love growing and developing my team members. I love partnering with the business on strategic thinking. I was curious about this idea of uh, effective leadership and I retrained. I went back to school full time into human resources. And it was uh, interesting when I told my team I was leaving, the first thing they said is, oh, where are you going? And maybe we'll join you. And I said, well, I'm going back to school. And their next response was, wow, you're crazy. Right. Why would you do such a thing? Mm -hmm. And then I told them what I was going to go and do, what my interests were. And they said, oh, wow, you'll be so good at that. So they went from crazy to what a great idea. And I went back to school full time and got my HR designation from Mount Royal University. And uh, coming out of Mount Royal University, I ended up in an HR role where I had uh, part of my role was helping turn around the um, culture and leadership and team interaction for a third of the organization that was seconded to a client. And there was hoarding of work between teams. There were technical leaders, again, that had been promoted, but not developed as leaders. And there was a culture gap between the head office and the seconded team. And it was seen as where your career went to go and die. And I wouldn't want to go there either. And within a, a couple of years, helped uh, that leadership team turn things around. And it wasn't just me that did it. I was just part of the team that helped things turn around and got to a, a point where my role was going to change into more generalist HR work, which was not what I was passionate about. And I thought I can go and find a new project and move to a new organization and a new job. And instead, I, uh, through some advice of some mentors along the way, discovered that the impact that I really want to have comes from being an external consultant. And I layered on professional coach training and started in Saito in 2009. 
And what a time to start a business at a time that was a global recession. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, also the very best time to start a business because anybody can start a business when times are booming. But it takes relationships to start a business when uh, we're in crisis, when there is no easy opportunity. And I, since then, have learned to uh, make my own luck and to rely on the strength of relationships and con contribution. And so since uh, starting in Saito, I have served on numerous boards in our community, whether it's in my profession, if the business community for cultural organization, for youth in our city, for um, the community we live in, including the, supporting the parks that we all enjoy. That's been a real foundational part of the work that I've done over the last decade. So that's a, a little Ooh. bit about me. There is so much, uh, so many places to go, but uh, unfortunately, uh, you know what? I already know we'll have you on numerous times because there are so many threads to to uh, unravel there. But uh, coincidentally, I was in IT for many years as a project manager uh, for a large telecommunications company, which uh, used to be Alberta based, but now it's national, and you know won't get go into a ton of detail there. And and it was really interesting because in IT and a lot of the technical um, areas, people get promoted. And in fact, I think this is probably true across all areas, but people get promoted not because of their ability to deal with people and build relationships and and, and lead and manage and, and all of those other things. I, the tendency is for people to get promoted because they're technically good at their job. But I think yeah. that, and we see it in emergency management all the time, that just because you're good at the tactics oftentimes actually does not mean almost automatically that you'll be good at the people part of the job. And, and ultimately, as you rise through the ranks, and I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on this and development, you have to start to open your blinders up and, and start to really broaden your scope. So in terms of leadership development, Jen, and then we'll get into, you know, a little bit more around the leader themselves, but what are some, you know, when you talk about cultural change, um, a lot of my clients, Interestingly enough, I it, it kind of um, it really distills down to a corporation or an organization what is important. So an example is in downturns and whether it be economic or whatever that is, my clients, my partners, the people I work with, they're like, Daryl, this is actually the, the time we really need leadership. This is not a time to be taking your your foot off the gas and putting money away from there because times are chaotic, times are uncertain and leaders need to step up and navigate through that that uncertain time. So I'm curious from a, a cultural perspective, you know, cultural change or leadership development, what are some things that from an organizational perspective you've seen that work really well? And, and I think that it's important to recognize that it's kind of a misnomer that you flip the switch and the culture has changed, right? So Friday, okay, folks, Old culture is dead. Monday morning, we're starting with this new culture. So using your, your breadth of experience, I'm curious, organizationally, what does culture change look and, and how do we get there? Well, every every organization has a culture, just like a city has a culture and you, you get what you get. It, it can be organic and you can be intentional about the behaviors and the values that you want to espouse. And I look at um, cultural development not dissimilar from leadership development and looking at uh, not just what you're developing into, but what you're letting go of. And you talk about those leaders and being technical leaders and being promoted for their technical capacities. And I think about um, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, and uh, some of the uh, things that leaders need to go to and what they need to let go of. And I think about the uh, often used phrase, um, what got you here won't get you there. Mm -hmm. And I see startup organizations being wildly successful in their startup phase and struggling with moving into uh, their growth phase and then later on moving into maturity because they'll hang on to who they were before as an organization. We're a family run organization. We can't have policies or we'll kill our culture or we're a growth organization and we can't do this because it'll erode that. And, there get, we get into a lot of this can't talk and not a lot about choice. And, well, and, and if I, I can just interject there, if I may, you know, further to that, we're going through obviously some trying times. And I've heard a lot of people talk about, I can't have remote workers, right? Our culture 
is going to shatter. I need people in the office, but I think that we've seen necessity wise. And so, sorry, I just wanted to also add to that because that's the exact yeah. conversation. We, ha we can't work from home. We have a culture to maintain. But I've had clients now that have been so surprised and not only have they reevaluated their work from home policy, they're starting to rethink some of them, their use of real estate. Mm -hmm. And whether some employees will ever return to the office because they found that people are more productive, but it was fear of what they would lose that kept them from stepping into the possible opportunity or how do we treat everyone equal and how do we performance manage someone who's not doing well and what they've learned is the same people that you were worried about performance management with are still going to be the same people and your star performers actually perform even better because you just got out of their way and they're able to do their work in the way that they're most effective and i talked with some leaders about you went out and you recruited the best people right you interviewed them you got the best resume the best expertise behind them the best leadership competencies and then what happened when you brought them in the organization that told you it was okay to treat them like children. You hired a bunch of grownups, you trusted them to bring them in the organization to do this work for you and let them do their job and have those tough conversations if things aren't going well and be a partner with them, not a parent to them. Well, and, and, and I think- it's a lot of fear that drives that. And, and that's, that's so important because, you know, yes, we have a, as we record this, this, there's a global pandemic, but I think there's an actual cultural pandemic or epidemic going on with regard to micromanagement. And that's a whole, you know, um, that's a whole problem in itself. And, and I think that as leaders, and that's going back to the conversation around, especially now leadership is extremely important because you need to let your thoroughbreds run and, and they're now a lot more independent. And like you said, a low performer in the office, it's going to be a low performer at home. A high performer in the office is going to be a high performer at home. But a, a lot of times as leaders, though, we under stress in particular, right? Chaos, uncertainty. We want to control a lot more because that makes us feel better. And I think that we've well, seen- Well, and that's one way. That's one way. And so if I go back and looking at the model I look at of uh, leadership development or even cultural development in an organization looks at some of our adult development theory and I look at a model from the leadership circle that comes from Bob Anderson that brings in some work of a number of other thought leaders and looking at how do we respond when we're triggered and this reactive mindset that is actually a really good place to be when you're frontline contributor. There's a lot of strengths in controlling and creating results by driving and ambition and perfecting things that we want. Or in another one that's just as damaging as controlling and leadership is protecting behavior that we wanna see in someone in finance. They need to have a certain level of arrogance or someone mm -hmm. in quality assurance to just have a thick skin and know they're right, even though they're gonna to get tons of pushback from their peers around them. This is the nature of their job or they need to take a critical eye or they need to maintain a professional distance to not get too close so that they're objective. And the other one, there's three, there's protect, there's comply and control. And so comply is the last one where I might get to results as a frontline contributor by being an expert in people pleasing and appeasing. If you think about customer service mm -hmm. and creating a sense of belonging for others or to follow the rules, to be consistent in my application across the board or to know when to bite my tongue, my tongue to get to the results that I want. But what happens is when we move into leadership and we lead from the same perspective with our strengths, we don't get to that new level of effectiveness because it's not the work's not done through us anymore. It's about inspiring and developing others and leading the business forward. But there's a lot of vulnerability in leadership that if we look to people please, appease, be right at all costs or control the outcome, you can't control decisions that have never been made before. There is no right answer. Or there's times where you're going to have to have a mentoring conversation with someone and they're not going to like what you have to share with them. Yet it's important you share it with them for the sake of their growth because you know no one else will tell them because they're afraid of hurting that person's feelings. And you're going to choose to do so out of care for them. Or you might, uh, for your integrity, step in a little closer instead of letting things go, step up and speak to someone about some difficult feedback because it's the right thing to do, even though you might be judged in it. 
because it's not someone else's value. So it's that journey of leadership development is very much a journey of uh, using your strengths in a new perspective and letting go of a lot of identity of who you thought you should be as an expert because you're no longer an expert. But leadership is stepping into vulnerability. It's this VUCA world, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That is vulnerability. And you can't control it. You can't people will please your way through it. And you certainly can't be right along the way. Well, and, and I think one of the things too, with regard to leadership and, and as you quote unquote, go up through the ranks, right? That's the typical hierarchical kind of conversation. Um, it really comes down to responsibility as well on the personal responsibility. So when you talk about maybe that, that person on your team, that's not performing at the highest level, uh, a couple things from a leadership perspective, have you set them up to fail or have you set them up for success? And as a leader, we see a lot of times, I think, where a leader would rather, you know, ignore, put under the rug and then hope that that individual gets moved, you know, applies for another job. And you know what? I'll even give them a great reference because I kind of don't want them on my team. So a big part of it is just realizing that from a personal responsibility perspective, being a leader means being responsible for what happens on that team and having those difficult conversations. And you mentioned the word vulnerability and oh man you know we were just talking just pre-interview here about especially in the world of emergency management emergency response male dominated you know all of those other cliches our model of leadership was bombastic it was leader centric where everything fed into the leader the leader the buck stopped with them um if i want your opinion i'll give it to you whatever it, it you know that looked like and that paradigm is still very much there but i've seen the word vulnerability used an awful lot and in fact in you know i, I wrote a book and one of the cornerstones of leadership is vulnerability so i'm curious just given your expertise around that first of all what is can you re restate what your what the definition of vulnerability is, and then we'll start to, to go down the path and, and see what that means from a leadership perspective. Well, I think I mentioned that vulnerability is this idea of the VUCA world, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and amb ambiguity. My favorite definition comes from Brene Brown, and it's a simple one. Vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And courage is the act of stepping into vulnerability. It's the act of stepping into uncertainty. It's the act of stepping into situations where you're going to experience emotional exposure. You might be judged. You might be overwhelmed and you, you can't control how it's going to go. And so that's how I look at vulnerability. And there's, there's a lot of misnomers about what vulnerability is and isn't. I've talked to a number of leaders of, well, I can't be vulnerable at work because I don't want to disclose to my team members all about my personal life. And well, wait a minute, vulnerability is not about disclosure. There's one uh, leader where he was super open, in fact, too open about what was happening in his personal life, whether it was his health, the breakdown of his marriage, what was going on with his children. But when it came to his relationships in the workplace, he wasn't vulnerable at all. When it came to giving feedback to his direct reports, he would sit down and hand them a three-page letter of six months of feedback that he had been holding on to and holding a grudge about and hand it to that person. They would read it over, think they were about to be fired, and then wouldn't talk about it at all. And so this leader would say, I'm incredibly vulnerable. I'm an open book. Yet they didn't show up in stepping into those hard conversations and navigating through that discomfort in the feedback with his team members. You know, when, when you talk about vulnerability as you're going through it, you're really talking at a visceral level. When you talk about the, the human condition, which is being mm -hmm. fear-based around, am I enough? Will I be judged? Uh, all of those other things, which is probably why it's so difficult to show vulnerability. And then you layer on the fact that as a society, we, you know, historically have viewed vulnerability as weakness. And, and now we are asking leaders to step up, but you know, reach that balance between, you know, too much and not enough. And, and it's really interesting because I just, when you said that example about pushing the feedback, and, and again, if you were to ask that leader, that individual would be like, absolutely. I, I gave lots of feedback. You know, I was very detailed in my feedback and I don't understand why, because if all you have is a hammer, Jen, every problem's a nail, right? 
And so what does vulnerability look like, you know, on, on the ground for, for the people watching and listening? So I'm a leader and I, I keep hearing this vulnerability word. Like, what does that actually look like? If I was to look at a leader and say they are being vulnerable right now, what kind of behaviors, what kind of traits would I be able to observe in them? A vulnerable leader, um, they're willing to share, as I said, those hard messages that others might feel uncomfortable in receiving, yet they will do it with clarity. They won't soften it, they'll be clear, but they'll also be thoughtful in how they deliver it to help you hear it. They ask questions. They ask a lot of questions. It's not about, I don't know. They ask questions like, tell me about it, help me understand. Well, what's important about that? And when people come to them looking for answers, they don't hand them out right away, even if they might have them because they recognize that that's not necessarily how they're going to be most helpful. And they also may not be answering the, the root question that that person really needs to solve. So they start with asking questions. They also uh, let go of perfection. And what that looks like is they discern what is enough. So if they set a goal, they set a goal that's achievable. And then when they're through the first quarter, and they're 50% through the goal set for the year, they don't up the bar. They allow themselves to reach that goal and then come reflect themselves or work with the team and look at, hmm, so do we want to set a new goal in this area or do we want to redirect energy towards some of the other goals that we have? And further with perfection, they will discern, okay, is it really worth putting in 50% more effort to get that 3% more results? And that's where the leadership okay. balance comes, right? The, the, that dance yeah. and that dichotomy of, you know, too much, not enough, driving too hard, not driving enough. And, and so in terms of, let, let's talk about trust, because I'm of the opinion that, you know, trust is ultimately the cohesion that, you know, creates relationships and connections amongst the team. What role does vulnerability have when we talk about building trust? And then following this, I want to talk about empathy. So don't worry, that's coming up. But what, what role does vulnerability have with regard to trust and cohesion and connection, in your opinion, and in your experience? You can't have one without the other, but it's also the chicken and the egg. I hear from a lot of leaders, I will be more vulnerable when I can trust those around me. And then, well, I can't trust them. So then, well, how do we ever get to be more vulnerable? Well, I need them to be more trustworthy or I need them to be a little bit more vulnerable with me. And as the leader, you go first. I'm sorry, I talk with a lot of leaders about you signed up for the hardest job ever and it is not fair. You go first, that's the job, that's what you signed up for and it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Uh, not just physically, psychologically because you're the one continuing to put yourself in emotional danger again and again. And, Trust and vulnerability, they're built in these small moments, a little incrementally. And an act of vulnerability is making something that's important to me um, at risk of your actions, at risk of your judgment, at risk of you following through with that thing that's important to me, uh, in some way at risk to your actions. Yet when I make something, even something small, uh, at risk to your actions, and you safeguard it, and you care for it well, then I now trust you a little more. And then I'll be a little bit more vulnerable with you. And I have a positive experience, then I'll be vulnerable again. And when I have a negative experience, that will erode some of my trust or maybe shatter trust completely. Yet it can be rebuilt again in small moments over time. But you can't have trust without vulnerability. You can't have vulnerability without trust. And it takes that, that leap to take that first step and also not to jump in too much too soon. I've talked with some leaders about, I trust everybody implicitly mm -hmm. and I'll challenge them. Okay, so we'll talk about a work test. Absolutely, I would do that, great. So then we've got different kinds of trust. What about if you go to a coffee shop? Would you trust a stranger to watch your bag in your laptop while you use the washroom? Totally, okay. great. Would you trust that tra same stranger, having never met them before, to watch your child for the next eight hours? We'll know that's different, right. okay. So that's an example of vulnerability-based trust, that it has to be earned in those small moments over time. And what's vulnerable for me is not necessarily what's vulnerable for you. It's all individualized and personal, what um, is important to each one of us and to what degree. And when it comes to uh, trust, trust requires 
boundaries. And if we trust too much too soon or we're vulnerable too much too soon, we've violated our own personal boundaries. It also requires reliability when we have repeated experiences with someone of um, them caring for what's important to us and they follow through and they keep their word, we trust them a little more. And when people keep their confidences, but also don't share things that aren't ours uh, to hear, I see it from some leaders, they're like, okay guys, you didn't hear it from me, but I want you to have a heads up of what's coming down the pipe. And then you share something confidential from the senior leadership team that you ought not to share. Your team will trust you a little less because you've now just burdened them with something that they ought not to know and they now need to pretend not to know. Not to mention the fact, too, that when you talk about going first, whether it be showing vulnerability, showing respect, right? We, we have this conversation a lot, too, with regard to respect influence. Well, my team doesn't respect me. Or how do I get respect from the team? Well, you have to go first. And it's important to recognize that that's part of that, that burden of and taking responsibility for being that leader and what it looks like. But I think interwoven through that conversation that, or the, the, the statements that you made is the fact that people are looking to the leader. How do they behave? What do they say? How are they saying it? And what right looks like? And it's not, in my experience, Jen, they're not going through a checklist saying, okay, vulnerable, check, oh, oh check. It's actually a visceral subconscious thing as, as, again, part of our human condition. And so I think leaders have to be very, very aware that they're always being judged. And if they're saying, you know, hey, this is just, you know, just between us girls kind of thing, then that's telling the team that when they tell the leader something, maybe that's not 100% public, that that's what right looks like. And, and that's a really, really important point, I think, for leaders to take away because that, that's just part of leadership. You're setting the tone, you're setting that culture, you're, you're showing what right looks like. Would you uh, agree? I, I absolutely agree. And I think uh, there, leaders that step into those slippery behaviors, they call them, they're often doing them from a well-intentioned place. Nice. You're telling their team because they care about their team. But, and you said, we're gonna talk about uh, empathy in a few minutes. Uh, what's happening is often that leader is operating from a place of sympathy and I'm in discomfort and I'm worried about you and I wanna take care of you and I don't think you'll be okay. You need me to now violate my confidentiality because you won't be okay. And I start moving into sympathy, not empathy. And I'm doing it from a well-intentioned place that does not have the outcome that I intend. Because as leaders, we feel responsible for how people feel, but it's actually none of our business in a way. And something that, that comes up often is, who am I to judge how you're supposed to react to something. So let, let's talk about, first and foremost, let's get this right out, Jen. What is the difference between sympathy and empathy? Because I think they tend to be quite interchanged when they really shouldn't be. So with your expertise, what set the record straight so that I can sleep at night, Jen. What is the difference between sympathy and empathy? And then we'll start to unravel what empathy looks like. Well, and I can't own this. It comes from Brené Brown and another scholar named Teresa Wiseman and the uh, my learning from them is the difference is sympathy is I feel for you. Empathy is I feel with you. Mm. And it's not about having experienced exactly the same circumstances with someone. We all pass when it comes to empathy because we know that feeling. I know what it's like to feel loss or grief or disappointment or joy or triumph. I know the full spe spectrum of those feelings. And empathy is being able to touch that feeling in myself and the experience of that emotion to relate to what it's, the feelings might be like for that person, not the circumstances. And sympathy, I like to talk about it being like a fence. Empathy is I stay on my side of the fence, I feel with you and I'm over here and I can talk to you and I can be a support to you. Sympathy is I'm going to go from my fence to I'm going to cross the fence and I'm going to go onto wow. your side and you're not okay on this side. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to take care of you. And even in coach training, we're taught not to touch our clients, especially when they're experiencing emotion. And in our personal lives, when someone is tearful or they're upset, we reach out and we touch them or we offer a hug, but even to touch their knee or touch their hand to comfort them. But as a coach and coach training, we're taught don't touch them. 
because actually it's a sign of sympathy of you're not okay. I'm not going to join you in this. Right. And it can make the emotion more intense. It's like, oh, oh, it is so bad. You're now over here with me. Wow. And it can actually make it harder for that person to move through the emotion they're experiencing rather than staying on your side of the fence and reflecting back to that person what they might be experiencing and helping them feel understood. Oh, I'll tell you that that fence analogy absolutely nailed it. And I think part of our, our journey as leaders and as human beings, I think, too, is, is to really get better at processing our emotions, processing our feelings. And, and that was so powerful in that if you stay on your side of the fence, you're still holding space. That's the important thing. Like, like you're not you're not abandoning anybody. You're not hanging them out to dry or anything like that, but you're just holding space for them and you're creating that safety for them to feel and process however they want. But that's really important what you said too, with regard to going over the fence and, and even just the act of, of touching them is telling them that, you know, Hey, that it, it yeah, it's really, it's almost, I don't want to say it's condescending, um, but it's, it's a little bit like that where, Hey, you know what? You need me with you to handle this and and man that that is really really powerful so so thank you for that i'm going to be using the the fence analogy a lot i'll send you 25 cents e-transfer every oh. time i use it or something <laughs> thanks man i collect my royalties on the, on the fence analogy it's gonna well, and, and you're right oh. it's it's this idea of you're not okay over there you need someone to come and join you where that you call it the the creating space and Here's how I talk about creating space with some leaders I work with, because it can be some of our, our coach uh, lingo that we use. And it's like, well, what is creating space? It is sitting there quietly while you are painfully uncomfortable to just sit there quietly so that that person has someone there with them while they're going through what they're going through, but you're not joining them in what they're going through. It's sitting there quietly, or it's checking in with them and asking them some questions about how they're feeling so that they can help process it for themselves. And it's about not being right about it. It's, you know, it sounds like you're angry. Okay, I'm not angry. No, that's not, okay, what, what is going on for you? Well, it, I don't know. And then you just sit and you wait. And, and as human beings, we dislike silence. We're tremendously <sighs> uncomfortable with silence, especially if we've given somebody bad news. You know, or something that's, it, it, I don't want to say bad because it's not up to us to determine what's bad. The news is once we give them certain facts and then, you know, they can process it however they want. But um, that's really, really important to recognize that sometimes not doing anything is exactly what to do. And you also talked about something and, and it's, a, it's a little bit of a bugbear of mine when we talk about, you know, how are you doing? Well, that is such a superficial basic interaction and you know we're, we're conditioned to say fine and we're also conditioned i think jen not to really care what the answer back is how are you i'm fine or how are you oh man my cat died my dog died my house burned down uh crashed my car and um you know my grandma died oh that, that's good okay well are you ready to uh get started here so i, I think that when you talk about how are you feeling that is such a it's a it's a it's a kind of semantics in a way, but it's it's not in terms of leaders. How are you feeling? And as we go through uncertain times like we're experiencing, I think it's a really, really important question. Not how are you doing? Because it can be easily dismissed, but how are you feeling? Or what are you feeling about all of this? Would you like to expand upon what that looks like? Because I think again, as leaders, yeah, I check in with my people all the time. I ask them how they're doing all the time and they told me fine, but now I find out all of this other stuff. So. Why is how are you feeling uh, going to get a much better kind of response back and a lot more insight? Well, how are you doing? I'm asking about action. How are you doing? This is how are you feeling? I'm directing you to what I want you to think about and check in on. How are you feeling? And I think the other thing that you tweaked on for me is what are you modeling for your team members? Are they seeing your responses always being good, fine? How, how are you? Whether you say, how are you doing or how are you feeling? What are the quality of the responses that you're giving them? How authentic and truthful are they? Well, also context appropriate for who you're sharing it with. And if you're having a tough day and there's lots of things going on in your personal life and you're feeling conflicted with something going on 
with a colleague or your senior leader and you're talking to one of your direct reports and they say, how are you feeling today? And you say, I'm fine. How about you? And you're wanting to just serve them. You're going to get that. I'm fine too. But if you say, you know, thank you for asking. Today is a difficult day for me. Mm -hmm. I'm able to be honest and vulnerable without violating confidentiality or revealing too much that might not be appropriate for the context of that relationship, I can still say, you know what, today, today is a really tough day for me. How are and, you feeling today? And, and I think that for us to make connections, the, the, the archetype of the uh, non-emotional leader was always stoic, always you know, steadfast, that beacon of strength and so on and so forth. And, and you mentioned the word vulnerability. This interaction, this simple interaction is such a powerful way to demonstrate vulnerability and to show what right looks like, which ties it back to our whole conversation that we started this with, that just how are you feeling really allows for that conversation around vulnerability and to be first, right? So even if that individual, and, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but even if the individual truly isn't feeling bad about something and then they ask you, how are you feeling, boss? Man, I'll tell you, that's a great it's a fantastic opportunity for you to say, yeah, I'm having a tough day. You know, we're, we're, we're navigating through this. Uh, no one really has all the answers right now, but we're, we're working through it as, as best we can. And I think what that will do is that now puts your, your, your team into a position of wanting to help because as human beings, we want to help. We want to do the right thing. We want to, to be good and do good. And so if we're not being vulnerable, we're actually depriving them of the opportunity to be purposeful in their work, for example, and, and being good human beings. And so when we talk about a little bit more around empathy, what does non, not expressing empathy or not being empathetic, what does that look like on the front line? So that if I was again to say, okay, so I've got some behaviors that I can see that this leader is being vulnerable. You know, they're asking questions, they're leaning in when they don't know the outcome. Uh, sympathy means, you know, I'm kind of feeling for you as well so you've crossed that fence empathy is holding space and, and maybe just being silent and allowing them to process but on the flip side of empathy what does it look like for to a leader or that what does it look like with a leader that is not being empathetic what kind of behaviors have you seen or would you see jen here is a, a story that's maybe an atypical example because most people think about the examples of as a leader on I'm walking past things that could be emotional that might be obvious, yet uh, a sneaky way that empathy showed up for one leader that I was working with, actively working on increasing his empathy skills, is around decision making and limiting the number of people he was talking to because he was afraid that if he listened to them, that he would have to change his decision. And he didn't want to because he knew deep down the decision was the very best for the stakeholders that they served. And if I listen to them, then I'll be obliged to please them and change my, my decision. And it's like, well, no, actually, that would be moving into sympathy. Empathy is paying attention to all the information, not just the facts, but the emotional climate and how somebody might feel and their perspective and being able to step into what their perspective might be like and their truth. Although we all have a lens that's bolted to our head, and even though we look at their truth, we still have our filter on, being willing to go there and be open to that additional information and the discomfort that that might bring up for you of, okay, I now hear even more how hard this decision is for someone, and I'm not going to change it even after considering that information. However, I can also be at risk that I may learn something new that I don't have to change my decision, but based on how I feel about it and the new information that I have, I may have a compelling reason why I may choose to change my decision. And so this leader, he decided, you know what? I've been stepping into sympathy, not empathy, and how I've been showing up. And now I'm going to go and hear those perspectives from people that disagree with my perspective to truly understand how to communicate hard news to them or things that may be triggering to them to, because I'll fully understand what it's like to be them. And then they'll also see my care and concern for them, even if it's a hard message, because I've demonstrated that listening to their perspective 
And that's really what empathy is about, is that perspective taking and being able to not only take in factual information, but also that emotional climate and this relational information that's available to us. That is so, so powerful. And as you're talking, I get the sense, and I could be completely wrong, it's happened all day, every day, my entire life, but occasionally I have a little gem of, of truth. But, um, you know, it all, almost seems to me that that particular leader, and and I, I see this a lot, they, they've been told or they've read or they've watched the YouTube videos to say, hey, you know what? You need to listen more. You need to be a better listener. You need to engage with your folks and they need to be heard. And so he probably, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, he probably said, okay, I need to talk to all these people, but oh man, that means I got to listen to them and I have to do what they're saying. And so I, I find that really, really interesting because I think that a lot of people think that they're like, oh man, I got to do stakeholder engagement. I got to do all these other things. And, but it ignores the fact that as the leader, part of your responsibility is making the decision and the buck does stop with you. And a saying that we use a lot is involvement equals commitment. So as a, if I'm a, if I'm a good team member, I will, as long as I'm heard and, and genuinely heard and, and considered and valued and valuable, even if the decision doesn't go my way, at least I've been heard and I'll, I'll hitch my wagon to that new solution uh, all day long. But a lot of times it, it just, as you were going through that, I really thought about that in that, you know, leaders, it's important to reach out and be empathetic so that involvement equals commitment. And you want a team that's committed and not compliant, which kind of goes back to the whole fear based. And, and that's the paradigm that a lot of leaders follow because that was the model that they followed, whether it be at home, you know, frankly, like, you know, my dad fear-based at 1 million percent and in the workplace fear-based. And, and, and so we're really in a, in a cusp. And that's why this conversation is so important because we're seeing that that old paradigm served us well in the depression, world war two, and all of those really, you know, very, I don't want to say black and white conflicts, but right now everything's so nuanced. Everything's so complex. Everything's so complicated and human beings, Jen, I'll tell you, that is the one variable. That's the hardest variable on the face of the planet and trying to navigate what that looks like. And so I'm curious as we wrap up here, Jen, man, like I said, I'm going to have you on again, if you don't mind. Here I am imposing. Yeah, I'm going to have you on, yeah. but uh, I would love to have you again. Um, but as we wrap up. It would be up, my pleasure. Oh, see, you say that to all the podcast hosts. That I get it. That's <laughs> fine. Um, so as we wrap up here, Jen, where can uh, where can folks watching or listening, where can they find you and what kind of projects? Because I know you have quite a few things on the go. Um and even though we're going through some very uncertain times, I, I want to acknowledge and honor you for leaning in and, and being of service to, to a bunch of people that really need some help. So what do you have on the go right now, Jen? Well, in the last month, we've been doing some seminars or some online webinars and dealing with some of the challenging topics that leaders have been dealing with, like managing their triggers under stress or balancing tough decisions with empathy has been another one. So uh, I've got those online. And so we'll share the link to the webinars that we've been doing over the last month uh, in conjunction with my colleague, Alana Peters. We've got an uh, upcoming Rising Strong workshop. Uh, we're doing it online to support leaders that are going through challenges at this time. Rising Strong is curriculum that comes from Brené Brown's organization. And uh, I'm a licensed facilitator and uh, called a certified um, Dare to Lead facilitator and a certified uh, Daring Way facilitator. So we'll be bringing that Rising Strong work forward to the community and doing it on uh, four Thursday mornings starting on June 25th. And then a, a new project that's near and dear to me is a project um, called Strategic Leadership for Men. And it's coming forward on a platform called Leveling Up. And this one's really important to me. I've engaged as a partner for the Women's Executive Network for probably a decade now. And I've engaged in a lot of mentorship and leadership programs for women. And uh, when looking at bringing forward a program for leveling up, we got talking about potentially a leadership program for women. And I said, you know, what I'd really love to do, I've been thinking about for a couple of years is there's all these programs for women and where are the programs for men to engage with other men? 
if women need them, men need them just as much to be able to navigate and have conversations with their peers. And we've got a variety of different kinds of peers being peers at our same level of leadership or our same industry. And women need to have conversation with other women and men need to have conversation with other men. And so this is a small group of only eight men per cohort to have intimate conversations about the journey of leadership and around empathy or vulnerability or the loneliness that can happen in leadership for men or whatever other challenges are showing up for you. And so that's uh, strategic leadership for men that we have coming up starting in early June. So we'll share that information too. And it's uh, something that's uh, a passion project for mine because more than 70% of the clients I work with are men and seeing the gaps in mentorship that have grown over their years as they've moved into more senior roles and they've outgrown some of their mentors and they've been promoted above their peers and their friends and that the leadership community around them has become smaller or if it's still a large leadership community they're not the deep intimate conversations that they're needing to have to support them as leaders so those are some of the things i have coming up and more broadly we uh, uh, we put out a newsletter every month to share uh, depth of insight on a particular leadership topic and uh, listeners can find out more on my website insido.ca Man, and and uh, I'll just uh, get on my soapbox a little bit as a male leader and predominantly from a type A you know, uh, environment, I can tell you, and if, if you're a dude listening to this, um, get over it. Get over the fact that you're not supposed to be vulnerable. Get over the fact that you don't know what empathy is. Get over the fact that men don't cry, men don't have emotions, all of those things. Get over it. Because your job as a leader, as a man, is different now. And and there's so many so many layers around that. But I'm telling you that when I start having these conversations, and I talked to you just before this, when I lead first, when I'm vulnerable first, when I'm empathetic first, when I'm compassionate first with my fellow males, I am... I used to be blown away, Jen, at the responses I get back. They're like, you know what? This divorce, it's killing me, man. And I get it. I get it. I'm not supposed to be, you know, and all that. And, and I'm not supposed to fight back or I'm not supposed to be, and I'm just supposed to take the hits or whatever it is. But that conversation, I'm telling you, men need to have that conversation as well. And one last little anecdote, Jen, and then we'll wrap it up. I remember I was, I was at the driving range and, uh, so it's me, it's an older dude, an older dude, and a young gal. And there's, so there's four of us on the driving range. And the two older dudes were, uh, were one was saying, oh man, I, I'm going to have to go home and I'll have to take the cupboard doors off and repaint them. And then I'm going to have to paint that wall tonight. And then his, uh, his buddy says, oh, you know what? You've got to tell your wife that you're not doing that tonight. You are doing one or the other. And... Um, and so it really struck me as this. And so then I was laughing because all four of us knew what the answer was when that person got home, right? He was going to take the cupboards off and he was going to paint the wall. It didn't really matter, but it really got me to thinking about, you know, who we talk to is so important because we, um, you know, we, we tend to think, we, we interact with the people that think like us and we tend to get group think a lot of times. And so having like a level up group is so powerful because you're getting a different perspective. And, and that is just so, so powerful. But anyways, there, there's a lot more to that story, but I won't bore everyone with it. So Jen, thank you from you know bottom of my heart. I, I sincerely appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule here. And we'll leave all the links, um, show notes and, and social media and all of that other stuff. And uh, and I'll get your email address so I can send you 25 cents for every time I use the fence analogy, even though it's going to cost me $1.50. <laughs> so I don't think the economics is really going to work, but I'll have to rethink that a little bit. But anyway, so Jen, thank you very, very much for taking the time today. And uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. Thanks for having me.